Thanks, Greg. <coughs> and so proud of everything you've accomplished and uh, continuing to lead breast cancer and doing a great job making sure that the patients, along with your colleagues, are getting the best breast care. And I can tell you that, having now seen how it is in other places and in other sites around the country. You guys are doing great. Okay, so you want to give me 24 minutes, huh? I'm going to have to talk fast. I thought it was 30. Okay, so we're going to talk about early breast cancer, and then Greg's going to do um, metastatic breast cancer. So I want to remind you all that there's three major subgroups. The way we define breast cancer today, the HR positive, HER2 negative is about 60 to 65%. Uh, HER2 positive is about 20%. Triple negative is about 15%. Most important <coughs> data is that data in the middle. How well are we doing? The five-year survival for localized breast cancer is, I think it's 99%. Um, so we can talk to our patients about this is not a death sentence. And even regional with lymph nodes, 86% are alive. Drops quite a bit for distant, but uh, as you'll hear, we're getting better there. And uh, overall, 90% of patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer are alive at five years. Obviously, we want them to live a normal life, and that's our goal. We also know that, um, that beyond the subgroups that we talk about, there are sub-subgroups, like subgroups of luminal A and B, which have different prognosis. And this slide is actually a very old slide, and HER2 uh, positive patients did the worst in the era before HER2 positive therapy, and we'll talk about the changes. I do want to remind the group also that, uh, unfortunately, both race and socioeconomic disparity contribute to outcome difference beyond biology and stage, and, they, and biology and stage also make a difference. If you look at that left-hand panel, you see uh, the ages of uh, African-American women tend to be, for triple negative, tend to be younger. And we also know from our own data at West that uh, patients with uh, African-American patients in our community tend to present with later stage disease, although th thankfully once they get to West, uh, st stage adjusted, they have the exact same outcome as, um, as white women. So we're, we're happy about that. It's the problem of getting them to, to the physician. In general, even if they, they do worse than white and if they do have triple negative cancer, they still do worse, even though they have more triple negative cancer. So it's a, a triple whammy. And if you adjust for age, stage, grade, and um, their poverty status, they are still doing worse. So we have a lot of progress that we need to make in the future. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is try to go through each of the three major subgroups and highlight the changes over the last couple of years. I'm going to start with HER2 positive breast cancer. As I showed you, it had the worst outcome in the pre-HER2 era. And then starting in, uh, starting actually in the late 90s when we did the first metastatic trial showing that uh, HER2 targeted therapy with trastuzumab improved outcome, it moved quickly into the adjuvant setting. And I still remember, and will never forget, being at ASCO in 2005, well, the plenary session showing the benefit of uh, trastuzumab in the joint analysis of B31 and uh, um, um, the other, I forget, the, the other trial, and the uh, a standing ovation of 15,000 people with that uh, improvement. People were crying. It was, uh, th that's really true, because of it, it really made such a difference. And you can see a 13% over time absolute benefit. Uh, and that's been maintained in multiple trials subsequently. So the results have gotten better and better for invasive disease-free survival in the HER2 positive early breast cancer trials with trastuzumab. So that's what you're seeing there. So how can we improve on that? Uh, but the first improvement was adding pertuzumab, another uh, anti-HER2 therapy, which, would, which was initially approved, interestingly, as the first drug approved in the neoadjuvant setting as a surrogate biomarker of PCR for long-term event-free survival. Once it was approved in the neoadjuvant setting, <coughs> it was tested in the adjuvant setting. And here are the results of the large affinity trial, which uh, in, uh, tested chemotherapy plus trastuzumab and pertuzumab versus uh, trastuzumab alone. We now have long-term follow-up on this data. The data uh, now at six years of follow-up shows that pertuzumab does help patients in the adjuvant setting. 
um, but only in the lymph node positive group here, as you see. The lymph node negative group does quite well at about 95% six-year IDFS, and there was no benefit from pertuzumab. In addition, there was some conflicting early data about whether it would work better in HR positive or HR negative HER2 positive patients. These are all HER2 positive. About half of them are, HER2, are HR positive and half are HR negative. And it turned out that in the longer follow-up, uh, it worked about the same. So what can we say today? Um, add pertuzumab if you're doing adjuvant chemotherapy and anti-HER2 therapy when the nodes are positive and add it regardless of ER status. Another question that has arisen uh, in the last few years on adjuvant therapy is whether we need to use anthracyclines in neoadjuvant therapy for HER2 positive, particularly as we've refined the use of anti-HER2 therapy with uh, trastuzumab and pertuzumab. This is the most recent study that tested uh, a non-anthracycline approach to a sequential anthracycline uh, taxane approach with trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Initially, the primary endpoint is shown in the lower left was, was PCR rate. They were essentially identical. And just recently, a couple of months ago in JAM Oncology, was uh, the secondary endpoints, the event-free survival um, and the overall survival. And you can see those curves are overlapping. So based on that data, I do believe that the, res the, the adjuvant uh, use of TCHP should now probably be the standard, unless in some cases there's heterogeneity about HER2, and we're learning more about that. I don't have time to talk about that today. But um, so there might be some cases where anthracyclines might still be considered. We also have the ability to do extended adjuvant anti-HER2 therapy with neratinib. Neratinib is a small molecule TKI. This was tested in the ExtendNet uh, study, which looked at chemo uh, after chemotherapy and trastuzumab. And uh, the IDFS at five years was 3% better, two and a half to 3% better, similar to the other benefits we've seen. And that was particularly true in the HR positive population, and also those that were at highest risk, those that did not get a PCR in neoadjuvant therapy or those who had four or more nodes positive. And so for these patients, um, I do think that uh, it's an appropriate drug to add neratinib for extended for another year of oral therapy. What we don't know is what happens after neoadjuvant therapy, as you'll see, which is the way we've moved most of these patients now. So we're still talking about adjuvant therapy. Um, but one other point that's very important for adjuvant therapy is that we've been able to de-escalate the therapy for smaller HER2 positive tumors. The APT trial looked at patients with uh, essentially T1, N0 disease, and they got just a single chemotherapy, 12 weeks of paclitaxel, and just one agent, trastuzumab. And you can see the seven-year follow-up here, the, uh, the IDFS was 97.5%. So we, our goal in breast cancer today as a mature field where we've shown benefit is to reduce toxicity, or a better way to say it, I think, is optimize therapy. How can we give the least amount of therapy to uh, decrease toxicity to patients and achieve these excellent outcomes? It's a great problem to have when you're at 97%. It's hard to get better. So how can we, can we reduce toxicity and achieve those results? And um, there actually is some data from the ATTEMPT trial which suggests that the TDM1 as a single agent in this patient population could be substituted for even uh, IV chemotherapy with trastuzumab. I'm sorry, with uh, paclitaxel. Now, we've moved to neoadjuvant therapy for early breast cancer, particularly in the um, uh, triple negative and the HER2 positive group. And the reason why is shown here that the PCR is highly correlated with event-free survival and overall survival. This is from a meta-analysis. And you can see, so achieving a PCR should be the goal of neoadjuvant therapy. And, and if you don't achieve a PCR, you then have the benefit of trying a different type of therapy and seeing if you can do better afterwards. And not, only, not to mention the fact that P, uh, in breast cancer, giving chemotherapy up front makes surgery easier. So we can convert, and this has been formally tested, converting uh, having to do mastectomies on patients to doing uh, partial mastectomies of breast conservation. So it's, uh, there are many advantages to neoadjuvant therapy. ASCO came out with this guideline a few months ago, and I'm going to just boil it down into, uh, for HER2 positive early breast cancer, patients who have T2 disease, or that is two centimeters or greater, or a lymph node negative, I'm sorry, lymph node positive with any size tumor are candidates for uh, neoadjuvant therapy for HER2 positive early breast cancer. 
So uh, I, we use sort of the same therapy uh, in the neoadjuvant setting, so TCHP uh, is a, an appropriate neoadjuvant therapy, but what happens if patients don't get a PCR? What should we do? The Catherine study uh, looked at uh, switching out the adjuvant treatment. Remember that in those original adjuvant therapies, trastuzumab was given for a year. So chemotherapy usually for three or four months and with trastuzumab and then trastuzumab to complete a year of therapy. That remains the standard. And uh, in, this, in Catherine, they looked at using the antibody drug conjugate TDM1 as opposed to trastuzumab to complete that year of therapy after uh, a non-PCR. And these were the results. They were really um, quite good, about a 10, 11% improvement in three-year disease-free survival with TDM1 over trastuzumab. Many of these patients were very high-risk patients. Um, and, but even if they were low-risk patients, they benefited from TDM1. And uh, if you look at the distance, the freedom from distant recurrence on the right, it's about a 6 to 7% improvement. But if you keep in mind that curve, it's still dropping, and there are patients who are still not benefiting from TDM1. We also thought about de-escalating neoadjuvant therapy in the same way we de-escalated adjuvant therapy. This is a very provocative trial from the West uh, German study group that looked at either giving no chemo, just antibodies alone, which is that uh, curve on the left there. So a modest PCR rate, but a real one, so there, and it was maybe in the future we'll be able to identify the patients who need no chemotherapy to get a PCR. But even by just giving trastuzumab and pertuzumab and um, taxane in these studies, they got a very high rate, and you can see the distant disease-free survival is good. Uh, that was followed up with the ADAPT-2 study, which was recently reported. And so where are we today in HER2? We're here, and I really think these are probably the most interesting cooperative group trials I've seen in, in breast cancer for a long time. And um, they're really, it's two different trials that are linked together. Basically, the first step is to de-escalate, so giving just taxane, Herceptin, and Progetta uh, to uh, patients, and if they get a PCR, they get no further chemo. It's a little audacious, but I think it's grounded in both biology and in clinical data. If they have residual disease, they get, uh, they get eligible for the Alliance trial, which escalates the therapy. I just showed you the TDM1. We're trying to get over that 90%. And in this case, it's TDM1 as the standard versus TDM1 and tucatinib, another small molecule. And actually, I just, uh, I just started that study in my new institution. So we'll see what happens. Uh, triple negative breast cancer. We're going to move on. So do all new patients with triple negative breast cancer need chemotherapy? Unfortunately, the answer is the vast majority of them do. We don't have targeted therapy for triple negative breast cancer. The gray bars are the uh, historical rates of disease-free survival at 10 years, and they're not very good even for patients with no negative disease. Over um, a third of them are relapsing and node positive as much as 50% or even greater. So we have to give chemotherapy to the large majority of these patients. And uh, typically, the standard has been ACT, usually dose dense. Uh, the question has been, should we add more things? So neoadjuvant carbo has been tested in several trials. And I'm showing you the three largest, GEPR6, uh, CLGB40603, and brightness. And uh, the first two had uh, conflicting results. They, they both showed an increase in PCR, although it was much greater in GEPR6 uh, than it was in the CLGB study. And then if you look at the, the event-free survival, which is really the bottom line because P a PCR is a surrogate marker, you see that it was improved by about 10% in GEPR6 though, but uh, non-significantly by 5% in CLGB40603. Uh, so it was an open question. I would say based on the brightness trial, which asked a couple of questions, I was just going to focus on the carbo here, it, it, which increased the uh, PCR rate by over 20%, just published two weeks ago, and I just put that in. So I, the, the colors are the same, but the, the flip is, is a little different. I couldn't figure out how to get uh, PowerPoint to work that way. So um, the carbo is on top, 78% uh, versus 69%. So I think we now have two large trials. And I was on the fence, but having seen this, I, I do think patients should get it. And I'll explain to you why it's sort of a moot point in a minute. 
Uh, in adjuvant therapy, after neoadjuvant therapy, our best trial is the CREATE-X trial, which was done in Asia. This shows the results for triple negative breast cancer, capecitabine added after uh, dose-dense ACT and residual disease, improved the outcome and also improved the overall survival, so that's become our standard. The newest kit on the block is combining uh, chemotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors, and there's a good rationale, which I won't go over in the interest of time, for combining chemotherapy and anti pdl one especially in early breast cancer. So that led to neoadjuvant immunotherapy in early uh, stage triple negative breast cancer, two trials, the large, uh, uh, largest trial, the Keynote 522 study, over 1,100 patients, and the Impassion 031, with very similar designs except for no carbo in the Impassion and uh, a different uh, checkpoint inhibitor, pembrolizumab in 522 and uh, atezolizumab in 031. And uh, because of the size of the trial, there were co-primary endpoints of uh, PCR and event-free survival in 522 and uh, PCR in 031. Uh, there were also uh, differences in placebo control and so forth. So these were the results of the uh, primary endpoint of PCR. In both cases, unselected by PDL1 positivity, patients with stage 2 and 3 triple negative breast cancer had a 13 to 13 to 15 percent improvement in PCR rate. Uh, so it, it worked in terms of that endpoint. And we just saw the results, and they've just been reported now, of uh, the long-term outcome for event-free survival and overall survival uh, with pembrolizumab and early triple negative breast cancer reported two weeks ago in the, in the um, New England Journal. And you can see here a, uh, about, uh, um, about an 8% improvement, absolute improvement, in event-free survival with the addition of pembrolizumab, both in the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting. And the overall survival, although still very early and not quite reaching statistical significance with a 95% uh, confidence interval that over, just overlaps one, is already at 0.72. And I would suggest that it's very, very likely that the long-term follow-up, the overall survival will improve. So that has become the new standard of care. So uh, it, is a, it is a rigorous regimen to give carbo, paclitaxel followed by AC with Pembro through it and then Pembro afterwards, but it can be done. Uh, in the study, it was done either every three-week carbo or every week. In my own practice, I use weekly because I think every three week is just too hematologic and, and fatigue toxic. And then finally, I want to go on to uh, HR positive, HER2 negative, early stage breast cancer. And um, one of the questions that arose a long time ago because of early data suggesting that ovarian suppression, like I talked to you before, uh, had a role in breast cancer. And we knew from early studies that com compared oophorectomy or uh, chemical uh, uh, suppression of the ovaries to chemo, like CMF, uh, that they were at least equal. So we knew there was something going on there. And uh, these studies, which continue to be just a great source of data and reflection, were launched in the early 2000s. And they were pretty audacious trials looking at ovarian function suppression in text and soft global trials that were done uh, in text, looked at the difference between tamoxifen or exemesine as the endocrine partner with ovarian function suppression, given mostly by medical means like goceralin or lupron. And uh, this, the soft trial looked at um, the same two arms, but also looked at the standard, which was tamoxifen. So tamoxifen versus tamoxifen and OFS or tamoxifen or exemestane and OFS. So uh, this was just reported at San Antonio this past year, 12-year follow-up. And I, I wanted to point out a couple of things. First of all, in the overall population, there is an absolute reduction in distant recurrence and death with uh, AI and OFS of around 3%. And remember, you've got to follow these patients long term because over half of the relapses occur after five years. Some of them even occur after 10 years. So the five-year data on a study like this is interesting, but it doesn't really tell you the whole picture. Now we're getting to the point where we see the benefit. And, uh, and, and uh, that is um, a, a death benefit, too, an overall survival benefit. So based on these data, and, and in the overall population, it was 35% lymph node positive. 
Um, I think this strongly supports using ovarian function suppression along with an AI as the best therapy for as particularly high-risk women in, who, are post, uh, who are premenopausal. But I want to emphasize to you that this data also supports that low-risk women do just perfectly fine with tamoxifen. Now, this study wasn't designed to test chemotherapy or not. It was an investigative choice. But these were smart doctors, good oncologists, and they picked, on, they picked chemo or not. And if you look at the left hand in the soft trial, over 95% people who enrolled on the trial, so at least they had uh, you know, some suggestion that you know, there might be some bias for higher risk, they did excellently with, uh, with tamoxifen alone. However, if they got chemo, again, based on the clinical factors, and in that case, I think about 60% were lymph node positive, you see that benefit of uh, about 4% benefit for the exemestine and uh, ovarian function suppression. So uh, the point to make here is that uh, deciding on risk, stratifying your patients into low, intermediate, and high risk is really important as you pick your therapies for these patients, even node negative. Now, of course, we do that a lot more, and we do that with the help of genomic classifiers. And so in this case, I'm just going to remind you about the Taylor X study. There's no new data, but this was the first trial that used the ovarian functions of, I'm sorry, that used the uh, uh, genomic uh, classifier to sort patients into whether they needed chemo or not. So if they got a low 21 gene recurrence score, they got endocrine therapy alone. If they got a high one, they got chemo and endocrine. They were looking at the middle score here. And the results showed that for the whole study, you didn't need chemo, um, that endocrine therapy was fine, and the d d distant recurrence rates were very low for patients who had a low recurrence score, so it's prognostic. And, and in contrast, despite the fact they got chemo and endocrine therapy with the high recurrence scores, they still had more relapses. So there's a prognostic element here that transcends the, the predictive value of the chemo. The interesting thing about, uh, an unexpected thing about Taylor X was that there was a key, the, an age and then ultimately a menopausal chemo interaction. So there was some chemotherapy benefit in women who were 50 or younger or premenopausal if they had that intermediate score, and most of it was in that 21 to 25. So that becomes a uh, shared decision-making decision with patient because younger women may benefit from chemo there. The question was, are they benefiting from chemo or are they benefiting from the ovarian suppression effect of chemo? That's still an open question, and it's a very important question now based on the results of our expander, which was a similar trial to Taylor X, but looking at node positive patients. So one to three nodes positive were randomized to get chemo or not. If they had, they went down to the zero recurrent score. So zero to 25 you would get uh, chemo or not randomized. Over 25, everyone got chemo, and of course, everyone got endocrine therapy. Large trial, 5,000 patients. And uh, this is the updated analysis um, that was just uh, reported um, in December as well. For the postmenopausal women, absolutely no benefit of chemotherapy. Those curves are completely overlapping, and they do uh, 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 really pretty well. The distant relapse-free survival, which is probably most important in terms of outcome, in terms of survival, uh, they, was about 95%. So postmenopausal women who have an, uh, a 21 gene recurrence score of, um, of uh, under 25 do not need chemotherapy. That's pretty definitive. <coughs> and premenopausal women, to the surprise of many of us, was a chemotherapy benefit across the spectrum of recurrence scores. And the invasive disease-free survival now updated a 5% benefit and about a 3.3, uh, about 2.5% benefit in uh, a distant relapse-free survival um, with the addition of chemotherapy. So again, the, pro the problem is we don't know, and every uh, way of looking at it to try to figure out if this is an ovarian suppression effect or a chemo effect. You really can't do it from this trial. It's retrospective analyses. We need a prospective trial that looks specifically at this question. Is it chemo? Is it, uh, is it ovarian suppression? Or probably in some cases it's both. But at least at this time, uh, for premenopausal women who are node positive, given the fact that uh, any recurrent score will, um, uh, with, with node positive, suggests the chemotherapy benefit, for most of them, 
we offer chemo today. So to summarize HR positive, HER2 negative, endocrine therapy for all. Um, really, it's a low risk strategy in terms of toxicity. So if they're low risk only and premenopausal, tamoxifen is perfectly suitable. If they're high risk and premenopausal, ovarian for function suppression and AI, and AI for postmenopausal. What I didn't put on the slide is extended adjuvant therapy for uh, up to 10 years in uh, selected patients. Uh, gen genomic classifiers can help there. For chemo, we're really working now for HR positive, HER2 negative for de-escalation. The highest risk patients, a stage three patient, four or more nodes, they're gonna get chemo. We don't know how much benefit there necessarily is, but we certainly don't wanna uh, miss any benefit for patients. For the intermediate risk patients, genomic profiling with oncotype and mammogram to help with the yes-no decision, and low risk patients do not need chemo. Last thing is BRCA1 and two mutated patients. Uh, the Olympia trial was presented last year at ASCO and uh, looked at patients with a known germline BRCA1 or 2 mutation and used adjuvant therapy in the higher risk groups where they had neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy, and they were randomized to receive a laparib for a year or placebo for a year, and these were the results. Um, even with just three years of follow-up, we see a very substantial 9% uh, improvement in invasive disease-free survival. And I just remembered I forgot something, but, um, oh well. I have to go back and tell you one more thing. Um, I, 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 that's like I lost. Um, anyway, you should test all your patients for uh, uh, BRCA um, mutation uh, that are high risk patients because even if they're HR positive, some of them are gonna be BRCA mutated even without known family history. And with this benefit, it's not yet FDA approved, it probably will be in the next month or two. Um, I left something out on, uh, I'm just gonna go back and tell you so for the highest risk HR positive patients, uh, we now have a new therapy as well, which is abemocycle, the CDK4-6 inhibitor, uh, based on monarchy for the highest risk patients um, and the adjuvant trial, which showed clear benefit now at three years of uh, event-free survival. So after you've done everything else, if you have a high risk patient, that should be the standard of care now. So marked progress in HR positive breast cancer, uh, where, uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, we're optimizing that. Triple negative, uh, pembrolizumab now in the stage two and three patients. We don't know how to add the other drugs. Endocrine therapy, uh, optimize it based on the risk of uh, treatment, and uh, we have new adjuvant therapy, and we have new adjuvant therapy for BRCA1 and 2 uh, mutated patients. And I want to, and the last point's really important. Disparities persist and require intensive research into reducing biologic and socioeconomic differences. And I want to thank and commend Dr. Vidal and his team who are working at this uh, in West and uh, on the national level. So thank you very much.